maybe you won't do as great on the Monday or the Tuesday, but you have been preparing. It's like prepare for a test. Yeah. For me, it's not about the result. It's about the attitude and process up to the test. Yeah. As tennis players, we're all pretty much struggling with the same thing, no matter what level you play at. When I started the match, I was very nervous. I was very tight. If you're competing, at some point, you're guaranteed to experience nerves and negative emotions on court, feeling the weight of expectation from the people around us, but also from ourselves. So for me, expectations can hurt you so much. Because how do we break it? Mm. How do yeah. we snap out of it? Because it's yeah. like a trance, yeah. right, isn't it? So to help you win more matches, I met up with former world number seven, Thomas Johansson, to discuss the mental barriers that negatively impact our performance. You can push me side to side for five hours, yeah. six hours if you want. I'm gonna stay with you. The most scary thought is, please don't push me. Thomas, who famously beat Marat Safin to win his Australian Open title, has also beaten players like Andy Murray, David Ferrer, Leighton Hewitt and Andre Agassi, all incredibly mentally strong players. So he knows a thing or two about what he's talking about. Either my level that I've had for the last five, six days is not there, or the player that mm. I'm playing has done his homework. So now, with the help of sports psychologist, Professor Brendan Stubbs, let's dive deep into the tricks we can use to overcome our emotions and ultimately perform at our best when it matters most. Enjoy. All great practice. Yeah, great practice. And the player has been playing unbelievable. We've done everything. We've worked on the serve, we've worked on, I mean, everything. And then when the match comes, on the Monday or the Tuesday. They go, I don't want to play. And I go like, uh, what, what, you don't, no, I don't, I don't want to play. And I said, why? Um, well, imagine if I don't hit one single ball in the court. And then I try to, instead of attacking, I try to listen and I try to, okay, but, Let's say we've had these six days here in New York or London or whatever, and you've been playing great. We've been preparing, you're, you're fit, you're strong, you're quick. Your serve is working great, form is great. Um, what is it that, you know, how should I say? Is there anything that can strengthen your thought, if you know what I'm saying? Because you've been doing great for six days. Yeah. What? Of, of maybe you won't do as great on the Monday or the Tuesday, but you have been preparing. It's like prepare for a test. Yeah. If for me, I, I have two kids. For me, it's not about the result. It's about the attitude and process up to the test. Yeah. So this is for me um, the million dollar question, you know, how do you make a player feel more confident, more comfortable on the court when the preparations have been very good? So it is a million dollar question, but I think a few things is yeah. it's not a physical issue. Like you said, they've been hitting the ball really well, yeah. they're physically fit, they're in yeah. great physical shape. Yeah. So we can agree that it is the part of the, how the mind is, exactly. is processing. and. Yeah. If someone gets to the point where they've been amazing for six days and then on Monday, they're perhaps, yeah. brutal, say Monday, they're perhaps feeling a bit of nerves, a bit of nervous, yes. mm. and they don't want to play, mm. that's, oh, that's not about the practices they've had in the last six days. Mm. That's about the that practices one. that have happened in those last days. And as an individual, what's happened in the past, there may have been you know, tournaments or key moments in the past, you know, perhaps even as a child, mm. where people have had played not really not well, and it's sort of bringing up all of those emotions where mm. they're sort of naturally a bit sort of stressed and we've got this flight and flight responses. We're replaying and thinking about subconsciously mm. at times in the past of you know often worst case scenarios if we're not in a very sort of balanced state. So we may be sort of thinking about you know this moment when I was 13 and I was playing in this really important tournament and I did really bad and perhaps you know a, you know family member or a coach mm. was really hard on me at that particular mm. time and that can bring up those emotions and that can be so frightening oh, okay. to have that replayed in front of you. That um, that can be what it's about. It's mm. really about, but for people, is why are you feeling like that? And that's an opportunity to learn. Not it's about what's happened in the past. It can be people's childhood experiences. We all like what we call pattern match. So we match 
you know, our expectations of the future based on what we've done in the past and mm. experience. And if we're a bit anxious, naturally, and anxiety can be a very good thing as well, then we tend to sort of, if we're not managing that internal thought process very well, we tend to match towards more negative experiences in the past and our fears yep. come up. So if we have, you know, particularly about a tournament, it may be a similar tournament we played as a child. Yeah. Make up it. Maybe the same surface. Mm. Maybe a player plays a child and have him as an adult. You know, can just we've not stepped on the court. We're physically we're playing great, mm. but it's just like I remember this time when I played this person, played this, and it's just sort of playing in that. It's just the power of recognizing this happened in the past. We're all influenced by what happened in the past, but that doesn't necessarily need to have a power over how you play mm. this force coming Monday on that. And understanding, because we don't understand our emotions and you know, fears and everything, understanding that it doesn't need to have power over you. It's going to feel one more thing. You can sort of regulate that through you know, you know, talking therapy and sort of strategies. You can sort of break free of you know, that sort of pattern actually of past do, distressing. Do you think place. it's about also getting some um, what if scenarios and almost coming up with solutions to those what if scenarios? Because some of the I know for me, because I used to play as well, um, mm. I mean, not to your level, like 260 ATP, no. so I played it's very good. I played a few performance. Yeah. And for me, I always found that the what if scenarios, if I'm going into a match and I'm feeling really nervous, mm. if I think, you know, right, what's the worst that can happen? Okay, if, yeah. I, if my back end's not working, what am I going to do? If this is not working, what am I going to do? And I think that can also, I feel like, can give it's player true. the confidence yeah. that actually, um, whatever happens on the court, I can deal with it. Mm. And I think that can also help. No, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. It's too fundamental. If we root, the brain's really complex. Mm. Like you know, processing things from the past, from the future, we're predicting, you know, and we're processing them. If we look at it really basically, really simply, is we've got like the emotional processing part and we've got the cognitive, or sort of the objective mm -hmm. part of our brain. And these are the two worlds which make sense. So the objective, you know, sense, the cognitive model is. I can look at this and, you know, if I lose this point, it's not the end of the world. And if I bro get broken serve, then it's not the end of the world. You've broken back, you don't need to give in again. That's objective, that's cognitive, yeah. that's, that's yeah. unemotionally attached. Yeah. But then we've got the emotional system of the brain, and this hijacks rational thought, the cognitive system of the brain. So if you get emotionally charged, mm -hmm. I don't know, fear about the past, embarrassment, shame, um, just sort of fear, then it tends to override that, you know, the objective mm -hmm. what if scenario. That, that, that is stronger, you would say. It overrides often yeah, people, yeah. but it's... If you're enjoying this video, please press that like button. And to continue learning from us, why not subscribe to our channel for regular lessons for your game? It's about how do we, how do we recognize, in its most simple sense, we've got two systems going on. We've got the cognitive objective system going on where we can sort of objectively plan. Yeah. We can think very rationally, yeah. but I'm sure we've all been in those moments when rational thought yeah. and decision making is just completely overjacked mm. by emotion. Yeah. And we've all been there, and some of us are more, in, you know, have time points or propensities to go there. So it's about recognizing and seeing, okay, I'm responding in an emotional way. Mm. How do I sort of break that trance? Because it become, you know, I don't know if you've ever sort of really got overexcited or over angry or pissed off or something. Mm. When you're in that trance, it could be five seconds, ten seconds. How do we break it? Mm. How do yeah. we snap out of it? Because it's yeah. like mm. a trance. Yeah. You're in it. It's like you're in it. And if you don't realize you're in it, you can just carry on for, I don't know, the rest of the, the game, the set. And then you completely Would you teach emotionally like routines to yeah. snap out of it. Yeah. So it's like, me. But how do you recognise that you're being hijacked? Because you're being hijacked by emotion. Um, and it's how do you recognise that you're in that? And you need to develop those strategies yeah. to snap out and say, you know, this is not the way I'm mm. being hijacked. Yeah. You know, for whatever reason, how do I snap out of this? How, how do you how do you deal with expectations? Because this is, mm. for me as a player, you know. Like I told you, I love this time of the yeah. year, and I sometimes played so well in practice. I won every practice. I played with top players and I beat them. And then you go into the match and you go like, oh, oh, I'm not playing this guy. This guy will be straight sets. I'm ready. Should we hit after the match a little bit? You know, you talk yeah. to your coach. You're so confident, and then all of a sudden you go in and you run into problems. Yeah, because either my level that I've had for the last five, six days is not there. Or the player that mm. I'm playing has done his homework a lot better, so he pushes me in uncomfortable situations. And this is what I try to tell my players, is that when you start a tournament, it does not matter what you have done 
previous results, mm. you know, maybe winning quiz. Okay, of course you will come in confident, mm. but everybody starts at zero. Yeah. On the day. So I say it's almost like a on Formula day. One race yeah. or you know you start at zero and then you work from there and as a player i know that if i've had for example one year i made semis in queens or i won halle coming into wimbledon i was very confident like very so this might be my you know yeah mm. and then i look at when i won melbourne in australia zero expectations Zero, and I mean nothing. Yeah. I guess there's no pressure then, right? You can play free. Exactly. You can so I, I, I came in. I had, I knew that I was physically very strong. I had done, I had done my homework. I had practiced really well, but my level of my game, the level of my game, was not there. Yeah. So I went in, and my coach and I, we, we decided, okay, this might not be the day that you play your best tennis. But you know that you are strong, you're fit, you can mm. stay on the court for five hours if you need. And now we fight, we grind. Even if yeah. we play bad, we fight. Yeah. And look what happened. First round, I didn't play well. I was fighting, managed to win. Second round, didn't play well. I was fighting, managed to win. Third round, I started to feel my game. And then from the third round, onwards i just played better 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 so in the in the end i made my best match in the final yeah. so expe expectations for me it's very dangerous how do you uh, deal how do you deal when you know uh, how can you try to communicate with the players when they are feeling great but also when they're not feeling great because it's expectations we all know that you have four tournaments a year where all I mean, that's where you really want to perform your best. Yeah. So every player going into mm -hmm. all those four tournaments have extra pressure because they say, okay, I, I want to do well here. I want to do second week or I want to do a semi-final, you know. Yeah. So for me, expectations can hurt you so much. I agree. But in the yeah. final, for example, you went and sat down. What yeah. were you saying to yourself after that? Like, you know, because there's expectation now. You're like, I'm in the final. Actually, I'm playing great tennis. I could win this. And now yeah. you've got to sit down. What were you telling yourself at that point? What were you trying to go back to? I don't know how to say this, but I was very awake and aware of myself, of my level, because I had such a high level. I played my best tennis in my life. Yeah. you know second week of the of that tournament so when i started the match i was very nervous i was very tight i knew that this might be the only and it was the only grand slam final um, i made i have to perform my best so in the beginning i was very nervous very tight marat was smart he won the toss and he looked at me and he smiled and he said i received because he saw that i was you know lost my service straight away mm. But in the end of the first set, I started, ah, now it's coming, now it's coming. So I started to build and build and build. And then, like I said, I just, my level just went like this in the final as well. And in the tie break in the fourth, I played my best tennis in my life. So, but I'm an old man. <laughs> I've been experienced a lot. So sometimes you, you coach young players. And then you want to try to help them with the expectations. Because for me, they yeah, they are because yeah, if you have yeah, expectations yeah, to a certain point can be helpful because you want to do your best. Yeah. But when it tips over to a point where it's not, then it becomes like completely burdensome mm. and completely swallowing like presumptive. So it's it's all about you know, like we heard Alex is like she's right on this, but how do we get into what we call the flow state? Yeah. It's that sort of state where we're not really we're not really consciously thinking about Sort of things in a really over critical or anal analytical way. Mm -hmm. We're just sort of playing the point and we're yeah. just there and we're present and we're sort of you know detached from engaging with the chatter and the sort of background thing of this is the most important match of my life and I must do this and I'm a bit down. Yes, but how do we detach from you know, those sort of expectations yeah, and actually get into that sort of flow state and like, here I am thinking of all I'm going to go and play with this. How do we sort of get there? And the sort of over rumination and thinking it's just not good for any of us. Mm. Stop. Mm. Oh, it's it's anything else? 
And you know, a lot of this stuff is when we have a lot of expectations and we really start to get hijacked by the emotional past yes. then it's about we start to replay, you know, again, you know, yeah. negative experiences in the past mm -hmm. and then sort of come into the fore and it's not a reality, we may have like yeah, we may be able to beat this person lots of times, so if we're sort of overburdened with emotion and expectation, and we can sort of bring that to the fore, and we make that our future reality mm -hmm. by bringing stuff in the past with which we've not really dealt with. So maybe often people are not aware of this, particularly these matching tournaments and experiences that when the when the when the stuff really gets deep, people bring back into the forefront and freeze mm. and it's just bringing back painful experiences in the past and then that, that that's what dealt with it plays out in front of us again. Mm. Do you think it's a, a way of just putting yourself into those situations as often as possible to make you almost numb like used to it doing it do you know what I mean so like yeah. obviously if you're playing it the first time ever at a grand slam you're nervous you know you've played well, 50 grand slams you're fine you know so is that just a way of like you just have to throw yourself in as much as possible into the well, deep end? I'm happy at it, and you know I'm not a professional tennis player, I'm not a professional tennis coach, but I, I've worked with a lot of people who mm. you know, deal with the mind and how to mm. maximize the mind. So it's it's really about you know we need strategies to deal with this before we get onto the court. We do an event, we need strategies when we go in. So if we fall into these trances, how do we get out? Mm. How do we recognise? Because if we don't recognise, if you don't recognise. I'm, I'm stressed, depressed, you might not even come off and you might just be pissed off and not be able to say it. Mm. So it's how do we first of all recognise and then snap out of it? Mm. Because if you don't recognise it, snap out of it, and have tactics, yep. then it's just going to keep repeating itself. Mm. And it'll often repeat itself in the most tight and difficult moments. And so that's like before court and encore stuff. And then also if there's been stuff in the past, most people have just said, when a difficult tournaments or experiences in the past that make you stuff in training. They've said, no, no, I'm fine, I'm absolutely good. But if you really start to talk about mm. this, people have stuff that can be unresolved and you can sort of really go back through and talk about how someone felt as a 13 year old playing tennis when they're perhaps majorly disappointed and sort of deal with that. Because what you don't want is going back to that sort of, I don't want to play. Because you know what I mean? I don't want to play. That's the 13 year old speaking. Yeah. That's, that's sort of exactly. That. That's not yes. that at yes. all. Yes. So when you're getting that, that's a frightened 13 year old yes. speaking. Yes. Something happened to that person when they were younger, which is making them feel like a little child again. You know? And that needs to be sort of understood in a. In a, in a you know, in a way, so they don't feel frightened because if it's just a frightened child, mm. that's what's happening. Sometimes I feel like, well, like now that I coach, um, I feel like it happens a lot. Also, players' egos gets in the way, so they instead of like dealing with them, putting themselves on the line, they go, oh, "I don't want to play. I'm injured. Yeah, I, you know, because it's an easy way, easy way out. It's an, oh, it's, it's an exit, an you know, talking. And, and it's getting another lesson. It's like yeah, an exit adult. strategy, exactly. you know. It's not an objective. Mm. It's the emotional process. You know, I don't want to play anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's easy That's to do lesson. that, yeah, and it's then it's like, oh, I, 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 I tanked. Difficult. You know, I lost because I, I tanked. So I didn't try it. You know, it's a child speaking. You know, it's about unresolved stuff in the past, and that will keep happening if you don't have strategies to identify and deal with it. You don't want to go digging up rubbish. Something happens. I don't want to play. I'm not doing this. I'm not good enough. But you know what? what you, you know what I've done a few times. What? I said um, I had incidents like this as a coach. Yeah. And I said, you know what? I go to the referee's office. I tell you that you don't want to play, and we go back home. Yeah. It's fine. And then they go, what? Yeah. They, and it's almost like it's right. interesting what She's you right. said. It's not an adult speaking, it's, not an adult. it's a kid speaking. Oh, it's and then when you say, yeah. okay, you know what? Yeah. Let's go. We, let's go. Yeah. Do, you know let's what, go. do you know what you're doing? No. You're breaking the trance. Okay. So they're yeah. in a trance, like thinking, I'm a child and I'm like 13, 14. I don't want to play anymore and go yeah. home. You saying that is like a step it up. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, we'll go home then. Yes. So all of a sudden there's an emotional yeah. trance, and that's a technique <laughs> yeah. that you've done as an external person. Mm. To snap them out of it. Yeah. But I can know, of course I want to play. Yes, exactly. That's but what happens. How do you get that as an individual if you can't talk to a coach mm. to recognize yep. my inner child is coming out and how do I snap out of it myself? Mm. What would be the techniques for that? What would oh, you find? different. Mm. Like that was helpful for you talking yeah. to that particular person. Yeah. You're breaking the trance. And if you hadn't have been there, then they may well have just hanged or done that. So it's about. As an individual, how do you identify? How do you recognise that? Mm. And then, when your coach is not there to do that for you, what can you do and use as a technique to break that trance for you? Because as a coach, and I think you agree, mm. if you coach a player that you get very close to and you spend a lot of time together, you you see it's coming. Yeah. 
you see it's coming, you see the stress is coming, you see the facial expression, you see the shoulders are going up, you, you see that the hitting spot goes from here to there. Uh, service is a little bit like this. So you, you see. So as a coach now, you can coach. You're allowed to coach. Uh, as soon as the player is on your side, you can coach. My question then is, how would you help an individual to recognize that? If you see their guy, yeah. what could you do to help them? If you were That's in exactly what I'm... So that's, I mean, from so, the side... I mean, you, you can see it, but can, can that person see it? No, you tell them? no, they cannot so see how it. How do... So... You know, is that how, because, you know, you can't always talk to a parent before, especially like men's game, I know it's different. Mm. But it's how do, how do you relay that information so they can... Because they can't mm. see it, because they're in a trance. They're in a trance, it's like... They need that extra level person, so yeah. that, how do you empower that person to understand whether it be like a visual view yep. or something you can replace them. And once you tell someone, because if you're unaware of it, um, then someone starts to tell you externally. So the more you tell them, say, you're going down, you know, you're, you're slipping down mm. this front. And mm. what, what is, then it's just, oh, okay. So the more feedback you give someone externally, the more they'll be able to spot it over time. But what does the slipping out of that trance look like for them? You know what I mean? Like, so you, you like, give them, it looks do, like, they, do they go up? Like you say, okay. We're gonna go home then. We'll mm. Tell the referee we'll go home. Mm. And they're like, no, no, okay, I'll stay and play. So directly, like in a match, if they're exhibiting that behaviour, you'd go, right, you know, I'm booking the flight already. Then what from the side, and then mm. that would snap them out. It, okay, it all depends on an individual, but yeah. if you see like they're doing a certain shot or they're throwing a towel down a certain way, and you know that then they need to be fed that information back in a helpful way as much as possible mm. so they can, because they genuinely can't see it. They're in a trance. Remember, it's just a trance. So yep. in tunnel vision, they can't see it. Nope. So if you feed that back to them over time and time and time, you know, look, you were going down this pathway and ideally stopping it, then that's mm. providing them the feedback loop mm. so they can be like, okay, and eventually they'll learn, like, mm. I'm doing, I'm doing this thing, and then they can implement their strategies. Yeah. Because they generally, it looks like they're in a tunnel. You know, can't. Yeah, and sometimes it's tough to connect with them mm. when they are in oh, this. In, in, yeah. Exactly. Yes. Oh, I'm so yeah. told. Oh. <laughs> but that is what's that? That's yeah. misplaced yeah. fear because they're feeling like they're feeling pissed off, they're feeling anxious, fearful. So if you're the person saying that, you're breaking the bad news. You're breaking about the trance, but it's all going to be transferred onto you. Yeah. Exactly. Which again is like a difficult dynamic. But if you don't do it with that, mm. but again, that's something else you can work on. Mm. You know, Again, I'm here to sort of help you break you out of this, to yep. go with this. But that's just, they've got nowhere else to deal with in a turmoil. Yep. If they just roll through it in a trance, if you tell them, then they come back and give it bounce onto you. Mm. And hopefully once they do that, is they can redirect it. Yep. Say, you're not, you're not really focused on to do that. I'm acting as a child. Mm. That's not in a condescending way, but I'm acting as a 13 year old as when I play. Yep. And I'll put this on you, it's not fair. And then you can start to deal with that. It's all about emotional processing and because, the because for me, you, you come to a stage in the tennis that we are now, it's not so much about foreign back and serve and volley. Mm. It's about handling this and also be, of course, strong in your body. Yeah. But if you look at the best guys, um, look at Novak, look at Roger, look at Rafa, look at uh, Andy, look at, look at them in the beginning of a slam. They're not playing great, mm. but they know that, okay. I have to try to survive this first week yeah. with as short matches as I can to save energy for the second week. Yeah. Yeah. They know, they are so, how should I say, um, aware of themselves. Yeah. They know that, yeah, maybe I will have one match first week mm -hmm. that I play great, but it's not here. I'm gonna, yeah. you know, it's the second week where I'm gonna peak. Yeah. So if you look at Rafa, Novak, Andy, Roger, oh. <coughs> Well, they are building from Monday, mm -hmm. match. Yeah. first week, until Sunday, second week. It's a joke for me, and mm. I'm so impressed with this. And that's, that's the kind of conditioning and the practice. That's this kind of like practicing. This is this is week one. As long as I get through, it doesn't matter. Yeah, the best tennis, and yeah. that's a kind of that like reinforcement loop. Yes, it's okay. I just need to get through, and the more you sort of practice that and feel that. Mm. And you've got lower expectations, or, mm. you know, it, it's all sort of feedback into modeling you. And the more we have experience of doing things well, mm. then the less pressure we've got. It's so. interesting that you said before your uh, Australian Open, even though you had no expectations, you felt in the best fitness shape of yes. your life. And yes. I think that the fitness element of a player's, you know, performance, it can be, you know, 
get you through those first beginning few rounds. Absolutely. Because you, you know I can rely on my fitness. Even though I'm not playing great, yeah. I know I'm fit. So I'm going to outrun the player. I might not rally them, but I'm going to you know, outlast yeah. them. You know, and yeah. then you can do that uh, even if, when you're not playing well. And I think so, I, I guess, with that, developing the fitness, I guess, goes hand in hand with developing yeah. the mental because it would help you to kind of almost take the pressure off a bit, saying, you know what, I've, I'm fitter than the other guy, so yeah. I, I don't need to put as much pressure on myself. I can tell you, as a player, it's the nicest feeling mm. when you enjoy being pushed. Mm. Because you know that, listen, you can push me side to side for five hours, yeah. six hours if you want. I'm going to stay with you. The most scary thought is, please don't push me. Please don't push me because I'm going to die. Or I'm going to... Because, and also you see patterns with players. If you can even see it, great players that they haven't done really the fitness work. Sometimes I say most yeah. of the time it's like that. When they get pushed, they Desperate after three, play. four, they go for the line, yeah. or you, or they go for crazy shots. And yeah. Then you go like, hmm, <clears throat> yeah. they are not ready, yeah. you know. Um, so so decision making goes off because the fitness is not there, so they start to make the wrong decision. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was an emotional player. I was very emotional and. Also, many times in the locker room, they said, oh, Thomas is a great player, but as soon as you see him start mumbling, then you have to try to go harder. I noticed that as I, you know, the stronger I could get, the longer time it took for me to start talking. This was my medicine. So the stronger I was physically, the longer mm -hmm. it took for me to... Yeah. It's good. Um, so I found the formula. For me, That's it was good. this. That's, yeah. How do you help each individual person find their formula? That's that's the key thing. Yeah. Everyone's well, slightly different. What would you say in terms of like training uh, hours and fitness and how, you know? Because I've got junior, you know, parents will come up to me. Junior players will write and say, "Oh, you know, how many hours should we be playing tennis? How many hours fitness? You know?" And I know it's hours and quality of time is different, but you know, they still kind of you know put it into like you know, should I be playing two hours a day, three hours a day? How, or, is it, or is it as many hours as you can? I'm not a tennis know. coach, I can't where, say. Where, what would you... Well, for me, what I see, what is interesting, and it's a good question, is that we spend... Tennis players have a tendency of spending a lot of time on the court. Mm. Um, when I played, we, we spent a lot of time on the court. Yes. Not so much time in the gym. And zero time on mental, mental yeah. exercises. Today is different. They have it... For me, they... Maybe a little bit less on the court, more in the gym, and also I think also more on the on the mental side of tennis. Yeah. Out of interest, what kind of if you look at all of that as a hundred percent, is it what eighty percent on the court, fifteen percent in gym, five percent in the mind? I would say sixty percent on the court, thirty percent in the gym, okay. and ten percent. I would maybe go fifty, forty, ten. Right. It has changed a lot right. since I played, mm. but but that's also why they have longer careers. Look at Novak; he's thirty. What is he? Thirty-seven. Yeah. yeah. And he's yeah, world number one or two or whatever. At my time, no chance. And so the f physical part of tennis has improved a lot, mm. a lot. You know, they are so flexible mm. now. They are. Look at their stretching. I mean, I was like a refrigerator. You know, I was yeah. like I could not. So it started when I played. It started with fitness, coaches, food, drinks, uh, oh, the mental side. So I was in the middle of this transition, I would say. And I was also in the middle of playing with Agassi, Sampras, Becker, um, and Roddick, and then Roger, and then with Novak, Rafa. So I was in the middle of those two mm. generations. eras, yeah, yeah. Or generations. Yeah. There were like probably the best generations that we've ever had. Mm. And what do you feel like makes like someone like a Novak, what do you think pushes him to be, to get that, you know, the, the most out of himself, you know, to push himself to that limit? Because he has to push himself, right? Because some yes. of these matches, they're going for, yes. you know, five hours or whatever. And, and, you know, what makes these guys be able to do that? Is it just kind of mental, or is it something that they're born with, or is it something that can be trained? Can you teach that uh, character? Oh, I... I don't know. I mean, of course, you can maybe 
try to teach a bit, but he is he's a beast. Mm. He's a beast. He's I've known Novak since he was 15, 14 maybe. Now he was sitting on the on the side when when I was practicing, and then maybe he said, "Can I can I you know can I jump in, hit a little bit?" So you know sometimes he jumped in and he was hitting with us when he was 14, 15. And he was so determined that he, he's going to be, he's going to be the best, he's going to be the biggest. Um, but also what for me is interesting is that, you know, John McEnroe had a tendency of when he got a little bit angry or pissed, yeah, he played better. Novak is the same. Hey. If he, hello. Are you interested in strawberries and cream? I'm very interested in strawberries and cream. So, yes. Okay, yeah. fabulous. I mean, thank you. I mean, uh, I, sorry. No, no, no. So, so, when you see that Novak is is either maybe with the box, with yeah. someone in the crowd, with the chair umpire, with the lines person, yeah. then you know he's <laughs> he's, he's fired up. He's fired up. Yeah. Like so um, sports anger. Yeah. So it's interesting to see. For me, it was the opposite. If I started mm. to yeah, get too. distracted, I, I lost. So, if it, I don't I, I don't know Novak personally at all, but I know from looking at lots of different fields what separates the exceptional people from very good people, like the world's best, is people are generally very obsessive, in a good way, like in terms of obsessive, mm. way, but obsessive perfectionists, and continual strive to learn and to get those 1% changes in improvement. Yep. So, yep. Yeah, mm. I don't know that, but if you look at like Lewis Hamilton, or all these peak performers, yep. some of the other people that I've met is, it's a continual strive for, yep. you know, self, self, you know, how do I get this, you know, extra point more percent here, point more percent there. Continual obsessiveness about how can I just improve. Mm. You know, just striving to always be the best. That's an internal drive and, you know, some say, you know, if you give them that, can you like feed that over time? And I think it's really like a bit of genetics, but then also the more you get that and the more success you have, then the more it sort of compounds yep. mm -hmm. and sort of better you become. I remember when I was younger, I used to watch a lot of tennis. So I'd watch, mm. you know, actually, I watched the match you against Safin. And mm. actually, after that, I changed to the Dunlop 200G. Oh, you the great see. one. You, see. <laughs> you inspired me. Because yeah. yeah. I, I was sponsored by Dunlop at the yeah. time. And, uh, and they said, oh, I won that racket. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, I went to play yeah, with that. Great so racket. It was a great racket. So yeah. I remember playing with it. And I remember watching the matches and kind of trying to analyze things, you know, a little bit. I, not just watching like a spectator, but thinking, well, where is he hitting when he's cross court? Yeah. What does he do? How is he approaching in it? Things like this. Do you feel like that's a big part of learning a player's development is watching tennis and analyzing things? Do you do that with your players? I try, but the young players have a tendency of not watching tennis anymore. Mm. I look at my son. My son is 16, turning 17. Loves tennis. Absolutely loves it. Does he watch? Rarely. Mm. So we are in a generation, I think, I, I watched everything. Yeah, when, yeah. when when Mats, Mats Wilander was my big idol, when he played Lendl in the 88 final or something in US yeah. Open, I put, I put the alarm. Yeah. My dad and I went up to watch the match. Yeah. It's a different type of, now everything mm. is so accessible. Yeah. So, I used know. to put the video recorder yeah. on. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I did the same. To wake cassettes. up, put the cassette yeah. on, and then yeah. watch the match after. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's interesting, isn't it? But and what, what I find really interesting, mm. again, is like we heard like Alex talk about today, is the importance of switching off. Yeah, new reference it as well, and how do you, you know, some people, everyone's wired differently. You know, how do you sort of switch off as well with this continual strive for perfection and know when to sort of put it in a pocket? But then other players. You know, that sort of, I don't know, I use tennis like someone, and again, I don't know entirely, but Nick Kira seems like really talented. Oh, so like me, he seems like really talented. Oh, exactly. And he strikes me as someone that doesn't, Amazing. doesn't study the game a lot, he doesn't spend a lot of time, as he's not, not on the strive for perfection like Novak, for instance. And then you can sort of see, does he have as much natural talent as Novak? I mean, I don't know, I'm not a tennis coach, I'm not a tennis professional, I don't know, but you can kind of see what is the difference around attitude to strive for perfection and how it can go he's, different ways. He's such a talented player. It's, it's, I mean, if you're, I've been fortunate, I've, I've been close to him a few times on the court and mm. it's, it's insane how he plays tennis. So thank you for watching. If you made it this far, you must be serious about your tennis. So let me know in the comments under this video what affects you most on court and if this video was helpful. Catch you soon in our next video.